Um, yeah, so hop right in, I suppose. Going to be talking about character design and colors and all that stuff. It's basically just a rehash of what I learned in Jason Martin's course and just applying it to a quick sculpt I did yesterday and also the character I did in the course. So yeah, let's get through what we're going to do. So the first main thing that sort of surprised me that Jason said was that even he still uses reference like every time he's doing work. So it, like I mean for something that you're not familiar with I can understand but he'll use it all the time. So he's sculpted like hundreds of faces or thousands probably but like regardless he's still going to be having reference up all the time. So he said rather than referring to people's work who have done something that's already been through the filter of that artist what you want to do is just go go straight to the source of you know, nature so essentially I pushed it a bit with the three A's here so it's so like animals anatomy and, and essentially nature so I've just yeah Attenborough but um so to give you an example of this so I used a witch grub to sort of get inspiration for this section I used to actually have this sort of patterning with the like indentation and the brownness around the edges and then it would bulge out where the um, sack is. But yeah, so it's sort of like having that level of abstraction, you can take just like a little piece of an animal where you have, there's no you know, copyright or IP or anything like that. And you can just go, all right, this obviously works because it exists in nature. Let's apply it to something that doesn't exist in nature and give it an air of believability. So. This one is just silhouettes. So a lot of um, feedback that he gave throughout the course was, early on I mean, was about silhouettes and making sure that the character is readable at a distance, but also that the silhouette conveys elements of the character's personality. So for this one here, you might think it's like, you know, it's pretty, pretty heavy, it's got sort of a hunchback, it might not be the most intelligent character or something. Whereas um, if you have something that has a lot of spindly bits it might be more elegant it might have a sort of a, like an air of royalty or something about it so because it doesn't need to be so uh, what do you call it? like gruff and stern and all the rest it doesn't need to go into battle it's just doing things from afar so it, yeah, the character reflects that nature of it so another one was this rule of not having things in the center line so he used the example of having 30%, 70% for your proportions. So if you see in the sort of crest I've got here is taking up the vast majority of the skull and the face is more squashed into a little bit. And this also respond, uh, is uh, to do with things like rest areas. So there's more detail in this area of the skull here around the, the brows, but then these big open areas here are quite absent of detail which gives the eye a chance to rest and makes it easier to work your way around the, the character itself. Otherwise, it becomes a huddled mess. So this is one of Jason's characters, and it also sort of illustrates that idea and also gets along with the next thing I'm going to talk about. But you can see the sort of the detail is really high fidelity around here and the teeth and so on. But then on the leathery patches, it has points to rest and so on. So you can get your eye just travels around it very naturally. And with symmetry, what you want to do is not... You've got to be strategic about when you're going to break it because obviously you're going to save a lot of time if you're using symmetry throughout and you want to get your proportions right. So I like to think of it in terms of... Just think about the, the ultimate outcome of the character. If it's going to be a game character and then you've got to rig it or, or whatever, you don't want to make yourself you know, like <laughs> bring a nightmare onto yourself because you just want to have something that is easy to, you know, finish up. And that said, it doesn't have to be like great differences. In my character, I've got quite a bit of, uh, there's quite a dramatic, uh, dramatic, dramatic uh, symmetry breaking the sack on his back that you can't really see as well there is entirely on one side. He's got one thing missing on, uh, his elbow and it's dangling down and it's uh, really like went to town on trying to break that symmetry whereas if you look at this here the teeth have slight offsets 
they're essentially the same model. You can see the crevice in there and the crevice in there. It's the same tooth, but he's just gone in and just wiggled them slightly. And the same thing along the center line here. Having that, those sort of stitches down the middle to break it up, sort of, it really does sell the illusion because that is the point where you'll start to see the things reflecting off each other. So having something there that's asymmetric or asymmetrical really helps, you know, make, it generates a more visual interest with that. So with those things in mind, there's a little one minute or 40 minutes into one minute sculpt I did yesterday just to sort of, you know, jog my memory essentially and see if I could remember what I learned. So yeah, a lot of, um, the thought I had going into this was I kind of want to just make like an ogre thing then halfway through sculpting and I thought I'm going to make it a redneck ogre. So yeah, sort of, uh, with the silhouette I wanted to make it sort of look heavy and convey a sense of unintelligence, which was good timing there with the teeth popping in. Um, and then I uh, got a bit political with the hat, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure about the beard. I think it probably would work better with like a mullet or something because it sort of loses the the readability of the face. But I wasn't really spending a great deal of time so just how long to. Did that take? Oh, what are you five minutes? What? Forty five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so nice. yeah, I do. So that's the um, end sculpt, and I just. Um, I used well the picture of the gorilla essentially. Oops, sorry. Uh, I was looking at um, this gorilla and also chimpanzees with like the front of the mouth, but it was sort of just like getting that um, you know, when, I don't know what expression they're conveying, but when they're trying to communicate something and they have their mouth sort of pursed and it's very very forward, not like teeth showing, just like the and it's all coming very forward. <laughs> I wanted to, um, yeah, have his mouth coming forward as if he is almost like a simian sort of thing. And then having small eyes sort of conveys that sense that you can't perhaps see very well or he's not overly intelligent. He doesn't have to rely on this sense. He's just a brutish sort of force. His ears are tiny because, again, not really big on listening, just more about brute forcing your way through things. And yeah, it's just... Yeah, just, just smells everything real good. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I may have added that. So, um, the hat, you saw the hat. Oh, yeah, you'll see. Can I ask with the re yeah. of that one? Oh, uh, this was, yeah, go on, sorry. Was it just a straight up re or did you use like this sort of um, guide curves to do that one? Uh, that was just straight up pressing Z remesher and splitting it out because, yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, I didn't want to spend time on it. I just yeah, wanted absolutely. to yeah, just have the, some yeah, like, I, Found some sculpts recently, like the lips are like really annoying to get to reconvert. Yeah, yeah, like you can see there, the um, well, the loops don't know. follow it. It sort of comes in an L shape. But then it's not even like, yeah, it's not ideal, but it's really not that bad. Yeah, for something like this where you don't need to animate it and you just want to have a low poly thing to texture and chuck into marmoset, yeah. then that's fine. Yeah. Um, another big takeaway from the course was about colors, and he basically said you want to have a gallon of one color, a glass of another color, and a teaspoon of the finer one. So the way this breaks out is you're at the gallon, which is the main sort of broad stroke. The um, glass is something that sort of accentuates areas on that. I wouldn't go to the extent of calling it highlights, but the teaspoon is the, the highlights, whereas just a little bit of extra color that makes the character really pop. So in this one, you can see the skin is basically the, the gallon, the war paint around his skull and down his neck and shoulders and all the rest is the glass and then his bright blue eyes are the teaspoon. Yeah. This um, artist, Joe Duchel, was one of the guys he actually suggested to look at for this sort of thing. He's got, he does a lot, this is actually not um, digital, this is practical. Um, what? That's a... Yeah, it's a physical model. Okay. Yeah, so he's got, uh, on his website, he's got a bunch of masks and things which are pretty insane um but yeah i'd recommend having a look at him for reference of breaking that up so taking this concept into my little speed sculpt i did i 
went to this little cheating website to um, get my color scheme. So I knew I wanted him to be like sort of like Caucasian looking with the skin tone and all that. And uh, I knew he had to have a red hat. <laughs> so from then I was sort of figuring out what do I want to have for my teaspoon of color. And I just ended up going with this gray here. And you'll notice that, I mean, this website is five colors. I don't know if you can change it to be three or whatever, but having a gallon of one color doesn't mean that it's purely one tone. Like you can see he's got some pinks in there around the, the mouth and the ears and the nose and all the rest. You're obviously going to have gradations in color and tone depending on the underlying structure of the face. So the lips have more blood in them, so they're going to be red. The ear cartilage has you know, been in there as well. And yeah, that's another thing that he impressed on us was that. Think about the underlying structure of uh, that area of the character or what you're doing. So it helps just sort of, when you think about the physicality of it, the external artistic side of things sort of just takes its logical course, I suppose. All right, so applying these colors to my character, I came up with this sort of color scheme. Yeah, so what it does is, um, yeah, so yeah, it does. It's like you put in, you can randomize everything, you just like spam space, and it'll give you a color scheme that complements each other and works well. So it's got the hot and cold, or even just gradations of one. But um, either so way, it's, you put in the skin and the mask. Yeah, I put in the second and third one, and then when it found these extra ones, I just locked them in. And then, yeah, just saw what worked well with those and yeah, went just with the grey because I had a bit of colour already with the, the red. So yeah, that's um, the basic colour scheme I came up with for that. Uh, yeah, again the same thing with having like a little bit of yellow in the teeth and the pimple posture or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, you can have those gradations as I say. So this is turntable of the thing. Mm. <laughs> He's got his nice little hat on and uh, yeah, any questions? <laughs> and what's that ring again? This is Marmoset tool bag, so that's real time. So granted this is like a super sample of like 16 times or something, but...